Life Audio. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? Or have you been in a season where it feels like He's completely silent? Have you been praying for a way to learn how to hear His voice more clearly? Hey friends, I'm Rachel, host of the Hearing Jesus Podcast. If you are ready to grow in your faith and to confidently step into your identity in Christ, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today, we're continuing our devotional reading through Matthew chapter six, and we're picking up where we left off yesterday. And if you're new to the show, if you're just joining us, what we're doing is we're going through an introductory series to the Gospels, where I'm explaining some of the history and the culture and the background that we sometimes miss as modern day readers. And so we're going through one chapter at a time, sometimes verse by verse. And I would encourage you, if you're just joining us, to go back and start from the beginning of the book of Matthew. I think it'll make a lot more sense for you. So today I'm picking up in verse five, and I'm reading right now to the New American Standard Version. Feel free to use whatever version you're comfortable with. That's just the one that I prefer to use to study with. And I do sometimes read different versions, but today we're using the NASB. So starting in Matthew chapter six, verse five, it says, and when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they will be seen by people. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. I'm going to stop right there. For context, what this passage is, is it's in this Sermon on the Mount where Jesus has gone outside of Galilee into the hills and he's sitting with his disciples and he's basically discipling them. He's giving them some breakdowns of some kingdom concepts and he's helping them to better understand the things that they have learned from the Torah. And as the author of the law, he's able to interpret the law and the Old Testament. And so not only that, he's leaning into some common areas that were misconceptions or misunderstandings of the Torah as people were living them out in this first century Jewish culture. This passage is right before he goes into the Lord's Prayer. And before we jump right into the Lord's Prayer, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on these first couple of verses to help us make sure our hearts are ready to understand the Lord's Prayer. So I wanted to point out a couple of things in verse five. Initially, I think what I want to do is spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of prayer itself and what is prayer? How should we pray? What are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about when we pray? Because I think it's really overlooked when we jump right into this Lord's Prayer. We spend so much time focusing on the Lord's Prayer that sometimes we miss some of the strategy or the intentionality that Jesus is trying to portray right before that. So in verse five, it says, when you pray, see at the time, Strict Jews would pray publicly at set times of the day in that culture. They would pray in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. And they would also do sacrifices and prayers twice a day, early in the morning, and then at the ninth hour. And so when it was time to pray, they would stop what they were doing, no matter what it was, if they were at work or at home or cooking or whatever it was, and they would pray. Now, some would do this discreetly, just privately, but there was others that were making a big show of it. In fact, some would make sure that they were in the street on purpose when it was time to pray, because that way they would gather this attention for themselves. Jesus is talking about this concept when he talks about in verse six, praying in secret. Now, what you might not realize is this is hyperbole. We've talked about this over the last couple of days that Matthew and the other gospel writers would sometimes showcase different literary devices or things that Jesus would use to emphasize various aspects of their culture. This is one of those. And so hyperbole is an exaggeration that is talking about a specific instance for the purpose of making a point. It's almost like a metaphor. And so when Jesus is talking about praying in private, 
he's not talking about hiding our faith. He is not condemning public prayer because Jesus himself prayed publicly on more than one occasion. We'll, we'll talk about that specifically in Matthew chapters 14 and 15. But what he's talking about is this fact that many of the common people did not have separate living quarters in their home. It was often just one large room or perhaps two rooms, and perhaps there was maybe a curtain or a little partition there, but there wasn't a lot of privacy. And so what Jesus is doing is he's talking metaphorically about finding privacy. And sometimes that would be in one of the rooms for storing grain, or sometimes it would mean going up and going into the hills outside of the town just so they could have some intentional private time. The point was about being intentional about seeking out privacy and alone time with God. It's really important for us to have alone time with God. If you need more context around that, we did a solitude series last year on the podcast. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. There's a lot of rich understanding of what solitude does for a relationship with God. It's part of the spiritual discipline series. So you can dive more deeply into that topic there. But yes, it's important to pray with our kids or with our spouse or even with our friends or at church. And Jesus isn't saying not to do this, but he's looking at the motivation. See, the motivation for the hypocrites, which we talked a little bit about the hypocrites yesterday, the hypocrites were praying to gather attention for themselves. And the motivation for their prayer was the attention, not the prayer. And so Jesus is addressing, again, that righteousness that starts in the heart. And the goal of prayer should be our relationship with God. That true intimacy can only happen when you're alone. Think about your human relationships for a minute. True intimacy only comes from one-on-one -on -one time together. You know, one of the tactics that we use as Christian parents, my husband and I, is when our daughters are ready to start dating. Now, we don't allow our daughters to date until they're age 16, but even then, it's group dating. Typically, they start off by group dating, and they don't yet have that one-on-one -on -one time. It comes comes later. And the reason for that is because we know that there's a certain intimacy that comes when you spend alone time one-on-one -on -one with something. In the same way, if my husband and I go too long without having one-on-one -on -one time together, we go on dates. We spend that intentional alone time together. And it's not that our time with our children, our family dates isn't important, or time with friends or time out in public isn't important. It is. But it's also just as important, sometimes more important for us to have that one-on-one -on -one quality time together. That's essentially what he's talking about here. And we know that Jesus himself had secret places for prayer with God. And we see that throughout the Gospels. And so he's talking about this intentional intimacy with God that starts with privacy. In verse 7, he talks about thoughtless repetition, or in some versions, it says babbling like the pagans. I bring this up because there's a couple things that are happening culturally here that I want to make sure we don't miss. The priests of Baal would cry out to Baal morning till noon. We read about that in First Kings. That was one of the false gods that they worshipped at the time. Or in places like Ephesus, they would shout out to Artemis for two hours at a time. And what Jesus is doing is he's talking about this idea of quality over quantity. And to compare Jews to pagans at the time would shame them deeply. And so he's talking about the hypocrites who are trying to get human attention instead of God's attention. And he's talking about the pagans who are trying to manipulate God, or they would even pray to many gods to try to get favor from one of them. God is trying to help us understand that that's not the heart of prayer. That's what Jesus is teaching on. You know, in my own experience, in my own past, especially when I was a younger believer, I think I'm very guilty of trying to manipulate God with my prayer. And perhaps I would say at the time, it was a way to calm my anxious heart. But I think really what I was doing was I was trying to get God to act the way I wanted him to act by going to him over and over and over with the same prayer. You know, when my younger daughters were, were young, I want to say maybe three and six years old, they went on a vacation with an extended family member. And it was the first time they had been gone. And I knew it was going to be a good experience for them. I knew they were going to have fun, but it was the first time they had left me for that long period of time. 
and they went, were going to the beach. And in my crazy mama bear brain, I had convinced myself that my babies were going to drown in the ocean. And I remember just praying over and over again, God protect my babies, God protect my babies. And I'm talking like obsessively, anxiously praying. And again, I would say that was a way to calm my anxious heart. Deep down, I think I was trying to manipulate God by getting him to behave the way I wanted him to behave. Now, of course, the, the motivation there, I think, was good. It was to protect my children. But as I was praying this, it was probably maybe about one o'clock in the afternoon, and I had been praying this same frantic prayer all day. God, protect my babies. God, protect my babies. Finally, the Holy Spirit said, stop. And it caught me off guard because certainly God wouldn't want me to stop praying. But he was trying to stop that anxiousness in me. And he said to me, I love them more than you do. And they're my babies too. And I'll tell you, that was a life-changing moment for me because, well, a couple reasons. Number one, God heard my prayer and he responded to me in prayer. And number two, this idea of God loving my children more than I did, like maybe on an intellectual level, I knew that. But on an emotional level, I didn't understand that up until that point. And of course, my children were fine. They did not drown in the ocean. They they came home and they had a wonderful time. But I think that goes back to this idea of prayer. And, you know, I will often hear from people that will say, women will say to me, you know, I I just don't know how to pray, especially publicly. I, I don't know how to pray. And I used to say that the only wrong way to pray was to not pray because Jesus interprets our prayers for us and God knows our heart before we even pray. However, I think after I've studied this passage, I would say that there is a wrong way to pray. And, you know, if you think about this in terms of what Jesus is saying, he's not pointing out the form of prayer, whether it is a passionate plea or a heartfelt wisdom prayer or a weeping prayer. He's not attacking that. He's not talking about the length of prayer. In fact, he's talking about how good theology means you don't need a lot of different words. And he's not even talking about the kinds of words used. It's not about the vocabulary. He's talking about the motivation, the heart. They think that they will be heard because they're using lots of words. And that may sound impressive at first glance, but Jesus is talking about how we should be aiming for an audience of one. And when we're praying to God, even one word can be a prayer. We see that example in the scripture. You don't need a ton of words to get God's attention. You already have it. So when we look at the Lord's Prayer, when we look starting at verse 9, and we're going to get into the whole prayer tomorrow, but we we look at verse 9 and where he's saying, then this is how you should pray. It's not a formula to gain God's favor. It's an expression of trust in a father who already knows our heart, who already knows what's on our heart to pray. And he's waiting for us as his children to come to him with our need. God wants our dependence on him. And so he's not saying, Jesus is not saying to pray this prayer verbatim. And, you know, like I just said earlier, we read together that it's not about repetition. In fact, he compares that repetition to the pagans. And yet sometimes what we see in some churches is people repeat this prayer over and over every single Sunday because Jesus said it's a model prayer. But what that does is it denies the heart of what he's saying And it showcases this importance we have of reading in context, because if you just take these verses, then this is how you should pray. And you always pray this prayer repetition. You're ignoring the things he said right above it, where he's saying, don't pray in repetition, because there's a danger when we use repetition in our prayer life. This danger is that, well, number one, it can lead to the complacency that we even talked about last week. And it leads to the sense of just this formalism that dangers us of just checking out. We can just kind of get into autopilot mode and it, and our hearts will check out. Our minds will check out. And the whole point of prayer is to connect with God. And so that checking out process defeats the whole purpose of prayer. The whole purpose is talking to God and connecting with him and taking to him the things that are burdening our heart. And so We have to remember, Jesus is teaching this passage within the context of this bigger conversation about kingdom righteousness and what that means and righteousness that starts in the heart and then affects our behavior. It's not the behavior first that we see so much of with the religious leaders of the time. No, instead, God is after our heart, heart first righteousness.
I think it's interesting that some people later in the first century did exactly that. They started using this prayer as repetition and they would pray this prayer three times a day, exactly the opposite of what Jesus is teaching here. You know, I think what I would emphasize is, and we're going to get into this tomorrow, is that this prayer is a healthy model because it shows us how to pray in the sense of there's six petitions or requests in it. Three of them have to do with praising God for his holiness, his purity, his perfection, that complete list that we see in him and his plans and his desires, knowing that they reflect his character and his purpose for our lives. And then it goes into three needs that we have. I think a short prayer does not mean that we have any less connection with God any more than I think a long prayer means we have a greater connection with God. I think what God's after is this sincere connection with him. And so given that insight, we're going to go ahead and reread these couple of verses. And then tomorrow we're going to get into the rest of the prayer. So let's start again at verse five. It says, and when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they will be seen by people. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Father God, we are coming to you right now in prayer, knowing that you know our hearts, you know our needs, you know those things that are burdening our hearts and keeping us up at night. God, we come to you with those things right now. Lord, I would pray even right now for my friend that's listening today, that they would understand that prayer is not about the words that we use. It's not about the length. It's not about the showcase that we can sometimes make it. It's about connection with you. It's about coming to you and inviting you into our pain or our pleasure or our our testimony or our lives, Lord God. Help us to recognize that you desire complete relationship with us, that that's what prayer is about. That's what this righteousness of the heart is about. And then that will eventually affect our behavior. But God, help us not to seek after the behavior. Help us to seek after you. God, I pray for my friends today as they seek to learn more about you, that they would experience the tangible reality of your presence in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, friends, we'll talk tomorrow. Hey, friends, before you go, I want to make sure you know about our Patreon page. The Patreon page is really a place to gain all sorts of resources specifically for the Hearing Jesus podcast and the Hearing Jesus for Kids podcast. There's a specific and dedicated private Facebook group, which is a place for me to interact with you, to pray with you, to answer questions. I'd love it for you to join us there. And there's also another level that gives you the inside scoop on everything else that's going on. The journaling prompts are there. If you've been with us for some time, you know that I usually do journaling prompts that helps us get that information from the head to the heart. We have a downloadable daily prayer prompt that helps you get that information properly processed in a way that it affects your daily life. There's also a Bible reading tracker on there. There's bonus episodes, lots of things on an ongoing basis, a place where you can get all the resources to help you grow in your faith. And the second thing I want to mention to you is the Dawn app, which if you've never heard of that before, I have good news for you. I just recently recorded a series for the Dawn app and also did some writing for them. And it's a daily Bible study and prayer app that is completely free. The link for that is in the show notes. And then the last thing I'm super excited about, I want to tell you that we're going to start having opportunities for travel. This is going to look a couple different ways, depending on what you're looking for, but it's going to cover things like mission trips in-person retreats, and also eventually a Bible study trip to Rome. What I'm doing right now is I'm getting everybody's contact information so we can start communicating about what that might look like. So if you are interested in any of that, you can head to shehears.org for more information. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you will find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more.
Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you in your walk with God, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, bonus content, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Know that you are so loved. Keep going. Keep going.